Greetings friends, and welcome to Breakfast in the Ruins, a Michael Moorcock flavoured podcast. On this show, we're venturing into the strange and eventful orbit of the Monkey God, Andy Darby's wonderful and chaotic invention, and subject of Me and the Monkey, Chronicles of the Monkey God, Volume 1. In it, Andy postulates, What happens when you're massively off your guard and you cross paths with a wild force of entropy and change? What happens if it takes a shine to you, or sees you as an anchor to help it find shape and form in this world? How do you process this? How do you manage the relationship issues with the neighbour's dogs? And how do you adjust your life to deal with all that, the outrageous behaviour, the consequences of the ill-remembered traumas of past lives, the clubbing with undead goth girls, and the mysterious black hole in the spare room? Just the ticket when you need a distraction from the UK's ongoing headlong plunge into bizarre, clumsy political incompetence and ensuing economic catastrophe. This is great timing too, because we're only a couple of weeks out from Andy's follow-up with Volume 2. Also, as we couldn't close with two Maria tracks last week, we'll play out with a title track from his latest opus, The Dreaming City 3. So strap in, pop a couple of super strobes, go to the bar for some scuff, put your feet up, spark up your hookah, and join Andy Darby and myself in Derry and Tom's as we discuss Me and the Monkey, Chronicles of the Monkey God, Volume 1, and lots of other stuff besides. <laughs> Welcome, Andy, to Virtual Derry and Tom's. And I should also point out that Andy is a writer, a heavy metal musician, a bodybuilder, yes. a martial artist, yes. a former American football player, yes. an all-round Renaissance man, and, of course, writer of Me and the Monkey, his first novel, Volume 1 of The Chronicles of the Monkey God. Welcome, Andy. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. And it's it's lovely to have you aboard because, of course, you are an old school hardcore Moorcock fan as well. Yes, definitely. Always, always a good excuse to have a, a fellow Moorcock fan on the yeah. podcast. But you have such a wide, vivid background of interests and activities and simply writing a novel just seems to be another string to already pretty long and illustrious bow. So how how have you been involved in so many different things over the years? Oh, God. Um, yeah, my mum always used to say to me, uh, you're not doing something else, are you? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you've only just started doing that. What are you doing now? You're doing something else. Well, to be honest, I, I think that everybody's lives are made up of different chapters mm. and that if you've only got one chapter in your in your book by the time you die then there's been something wrong with your life to be honest you know what yeah. i mean yeah. you you should try things you should do things you should experiment you should go and look at stuff and um if you find something that you really like then keep doing it and if mm. you like, oof it and then do something else and I, I think you know that's that's something i, I learned very early on and to be quite honest, um, Mr. Moorcock was very influential in my thinking in that respect. <laughs> mm. So, you know, he's got a lot to blame with with how I've gone. Possibly not the physical side, but with the um, the, the thought side and the, that sort yeah. of thing. Well, one of the questions that we generally ask of new guests who are on the podcast for the first time is, tell us about your history with Moorcock and Moorcock's writings. Okay. I started reading sort of fantasy stuff in, uh, I don't know, probably nine or ten years old mm-hmm. and i was introduced to that through um what's his name alan um the guy who wrote moon of the gomrath and um the owl service oh alan garner alan garner yes and uh, I, I picked up these books at school and started reading these and i thought wow this is brilliant like the uh, weird stone of brisingerman and all this sort of stuff and it got me really interested in the whole concept of uh of of a different reality and something that can impinge upon your own world mm. And um, I then, we had, well, sorry, we had a teacher at school who who read us The, the Hobbit. Hmm. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. But it had a sort of like a more of a, a kiddie edge to it than than even than things like Moon of the Gomrath, which is actually a kid's book. Hmm. And then I started looking at some other things, particularly Conan, obviously, because Conan's the gateway drug, I think, for most people. Yes, yeah, I think so. I was reading the Marvel comics of Conan, and uh, then I started picking up the books and read the books and thought, wow, this is amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. 
And then I was looking for other stuff that had a similar feel, but was perhaps a little bit more cerebral rather than just beating people up. And uh, my first Morkart book was City of the Beast. And um, I bought that simply because I I'd spent a load of my pocket money on a, um, a sci-fi uh, magazine that was in the W.H. Smith's. And it had a pull-out poster of the American cover of City of the Beast, which is mm. that dude fight, uh, sitting on the back of that thing with the human face and the guy chucking up the spear at him. Do you, do you remember that one? Yes, it's um, uh, some kind of bizarre mount, isn't it? With Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And is, is the guy on the back of the thing with the weird human face a huge blue dude? Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Massive yeah. blue dude with long hair. Yeah, I, I think I was... that's the same cover as the... Um, pocketbook editions that I got off Pops back in the day, yeah. Yeah, awesome. Well, I, I saw that and thought, wow, I've got to look at this. So I, I went out and found the book, although I couldn't find that cover. I found the the, the English one, mm. which is, I think, just a sort of like a stylized city on Mars. Yeah. And um, I read that, was hooked, got the others, got, um, was it Lord of the Spiders? And I mm -hmm. um, uh, can't remember what the other one is, but um, yeah. Something of the Pit? Yeah, uh, yeah, Master of the Pit. Master of the Pit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, read those. And then, of course, from that point onwards, I went on a more cock hunt and just um, started just buying up everything I could get. Mm. Um, and I very quickly discovered Elric. And that was it. And that was just, that was stupid. I was like, no, I must read Elric. And obviously moved on through all the others. And he's he's got such a catalogue of writing, obviously, that, you mm. know, you're, you're not going to run out quickly. Mm. especially as a kid and you're spending your own pocket money on it you know and you 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 sort of gradually over a period of time accumulate this big stack of books by the sofa yeah and you plow your way through them one at a time and yeah brilliant and it just um it just altered my thinking massively about uh, especially things like um the black corridor and mm. um and uh, behold the man Mm -hmm. and, and things like that they, they they touched on things that i'd already perhaps been thinking about um but they made me really think in depth about these things and, mm -hmm. um, and in a totally sort of like trippy psychedelic way, which I'd never, ever sort of like imagined could be possible before. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just putting the finishing touches editing wise to our episode on the black corridor. Yeah. And it's the first time I've read it since I was probably a teenager, yeah. but it's, um, it's, it's really fascinating to find that your gateway to Mocock was the Michael Caine novels. Yes. Which were, Essentially, Edgar Rice Burroughs, John Carter pastiches, weren't they? Yeah. but with uh, inevitably a more cocky and twist, even though he was very, very young when he wrote them. Yeah. And we've been, Phil and I have been intended to do City of the Beast for well over a year now, but the copies I get keep falling to bits. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be some kind of cosmic turbulence preventing me from doing it. I have this really wonderful. That, that very edition, the yellowish cover with a huge blue dude on the yeah. back of the strange beast. Yeah. And that, the spine, just fell to bits because it was just an old, it just deteriorated on the shelf over the years. So I got um, uh, Paizo Planet Stories, Paizo Publishing Planet Stories series. I got a copy of that. That fell to pieces. So I've now got a, a Savoy. I think it's a Savoy. No, it's not a Savoy, but it's a, a, a collection of of all three under the title Warriors of Mars, which uh, we, we definitely need to pull our finger out and get back to that because I was quite enjoying it at the time. And I did read those novels at the time, but because, I think because I came to them after reading The Jewel in the Skull and Stormbringer, I possibly viewed them less favourably as a result, but I really need to reread them and um and put that to the test but yeah. of course the other thing we need to do as well is if we're going to do that we also need to do princess of mars because i got that off pops as well and yes. i read that at the time and i was a huge fan of i mean i never read them all by any stretch of the imagination but i read the first two or three john carter novels and and was instantly whisked and transported away to barsoom and absolutely loved them as a teenager haven't haven't touched them since no. either mm. no it's so, funny isn't it? It, it's you you sort of like read stuff as a, as a kid and you you look at them and you think wow this is the business mm. and then you read something else later on and it takes you away from that and then looking back you almost think oh i don't want to read that because maybe a or spoil what i felt about it at the time yeah or it actually won't be as good as as you know and, and i and i'll just think ah and and then once again it spoils it but in a slightly different way i think it's um mm. You know, you, you start then to rubbish your heroes almost, which is a horrible thing to do, especially when you've grown up as a teenager, believing yeah. it. Yeah. 
that was a real risk when we decided to do this podcast because mm. if you're going to do a grand reread of things that you adored in your teens and 20s which much like yourself kind of informed your worldview might be a little bit overly dramatic um, but certainly informed the way I thought about fantasy and did have an impact on I suppose my views of um, politics and morality to yeah. be honest because yeah, yeah, yeah. It, Mocock stories have shot through that stuff Absolutely. but fortunately what I found is that Going back and rereading even some of the more lighter or throwaway stuff, if you can describe any of it as that, as, as that, it's still been such a rich and rewarding experience. The reread that I was dreading because I didn't enjoy it at the time, I actually got a little bit more out of it, and that was part one of the Fortress of the Pearl. All right. Yeah. So that was good. Mm. Although Loz is still grumbling about having to read the rest <laughs> of it. <laughs> so we'll get to that in due course. Um, but then you know doing something like the black corridor or um the rituals of infinity which yeah. i talked about with with keck w probably two years ago now they were re really really satisfying because I, I think they were wasted on me when i was a teenager to a degree and rereading them now I, I got a lot more out of them so on the whole while it was probably a bit of a risk and there was every possibility I could have ended up coming out of this hating Moorcock or being really, really disappointed in my own approval of him of 30 years ago, the reverse has been true. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the interesting things about Moorcock, isn't it? Because ah. he wrote these things in the 60s, you know, the early stuff, like things like The Dream in City. He's writing in 62 or 63 or something like that. And who knew that what is essentially a 40 page, it's not even a novella, it's a 40 odd page short story, maybe 38 pages. That one story, The Dreaming City, turns sword, sorcery, heroic fantasy, whatever you call it, turns it on its head completely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you about the, the, that whole business of, of going back. And um, when, I, when I discovered your podcast and I obviously saw the title and thought, ooh, interesting. Mm. And um, I was nervous about listening to it as well. You know, because I thought, oh, God, is this going to be a load of navel-gazing about Michael yeah. Moorcock? And I'm actually going to start thinking, ah, this isn't as good as I remember it being. Mm. But I, I, because I've, I've just finished, well, uh, part two of The Monkey God's being published on 5th of November. Yeah. And um, as I was writing that, I suddenly realised that what I was writing was actually uh, um, an Eternal Champion character. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I thought, oh my God, like, you know, this is an eternal champion character. And the narrator is basically the companion. Yeah. And he's describing all this and this is what's going on. Um, but it was in a sort of like a zany comic way rather than a, a deeply sort of like existential dread sort of manner. And I, and I thought, oh my God. So I, so I went back and started looking at the Moorcock stuff and thought, yep, yeah, there you go. This is, this has pushed me in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? Because I was you sent me a copy of Volume One a while back, and I was reading it, and th there are clues fairly yeah. early on. And of course, when when I'm reading them, I'm thinking, I know Andy is a Moorcock fan, and some of this stuff in here is um, playful nods and tips and winks, because uh, is um, it's a good read, but it's also very it's very funny. And there's there are lots of nods and winks to certain things. And there are certainly nods and winks to that. So the fact that you now that's feeding into your creative process. Yeah. You know, is uh, is really cool. And, you know, I'm I'm not a, a writer by any stretch of the imagination. But the um the Gerard Ath Connolly stuff that I'm writing, I'm writing he is basically a failed companion. <laughs> Yeah, he's yeah. not the he's not the eternal champion. He's a failed companion who will constantly disappoint yeah, yes, <laughs> and let yeah. and let down everybody who he should be. Because of course, the thing with the eternal champion is most of the time the companions are a Deus Ex Machina that get him out of trouble. Yes, yeah, but, but what happens when that companion is fucking useless? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, don't knock yourself with that because I'm I'm enjoying reading that. It's got a lot of good stuff going on, and it takes me straight back to the world of sort of like Hawkmoon and the, uh, the the Grand Britain and all this sort of stuff and the yeah. Beast Warriors and everything. And it's and it's good. It's 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 good storytelling. So yeah, don't knock yourself about that. That's really good. It's it's, it's good fun, and I'm enjoying it. Um, but I, I don't have any kind of um, I'm, I'm I'm not I don't want it to be anything that it's not. It started as a write up of a game, some notes from a game that Loz ran years and years and years ago, and he was my character in Loz's role playing game. 
And, you know, it's it's just fun thinking it through and doing other things and then, you know, mm. having Wayne doing music for, for the audio version provides another layer of, of inspiration. Uh, so, yeah, it's just good fun. It's good fun collaborating with other people on, on different elements of it. Yeah. But when you mentioned you, you came across the podcast and thought, I'm not sure whether to listen to this or not. Because you never know what it's going to be going to yeah. be like, and you know, I, I like podcasts. I don't listen to them nearly as much as I used to, and I should listen to them more. And I'm way behind on some of the ones that I really, really like. But when I first got in touch with um, Derek, aka Imria, the uh, the bleak experimental electronic music artist, I came across his Dreaming City album on Bandcamp, and I dropped him a line, and and he said, "Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll come on and talk to you," tentatively, and after after we talked and I'd stopped recording he said you know that's such a relief because when you contacted me i thought oh no a michael mocock podcast this guy's gonna be a crushing nerd <laughs> <laughs> and he was really nervous about it and you know in many ways i am a crushing nerd but <laughs> fortunately um I, I wasn't kind of like the the crushing nerd that he expected and yeah. <laughs> there was something at least a little bit more personable about it yeah yeah but yeah, there is when you and I know some someone on on Twitter has assumed that because you podcast about Michael Moorcock, you engage in hero worship. Yeah, and that's something I want to avoid. And actually, if there are uh, things and foibles that you don't like, you want to have the freedom to say, you know, I'm not sure about this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, with Moorcock, he doesn't tend to have too many off-putting foibles, even after rereading him. After thirty years, no, yeah. no, he doesn't. It, it's it's still very readable, and there's still a lot of stuff that you can grasp and go. You know what? That's still current. Mm. That that actually applies to what's happening now, and uh, in many ways, is better than some of the commentary about what's happening now, mm. um, even though it was written so long ago. Mm. Um, I mean, the Jerry Cornelius stuff really, really had a strong effect on me as well. In, in my late teens, sort of going out drinking and whatever, yeah. um, and to clubs and things, I, I really thought that actually I was going to be Jerry Cornelius. You know, mm. I, mean, I, I had that sort of thing going on because I, I was sort of like a teenager in, in, in the late 70s, you know, the 77 when the punk era hit, I was yeah. 16 and I was like, whoa, this is just great. This is this is the end of civilization as we know it. This is the start of something new and something bigger. Yeah. And uh, of course it wasn't. Um, mm. but, but all of that stuff was going on and, and it's all the stuff that Moorcock had actually talked about and this idea of a, a freer society and the fact that people could do and be what they wanted to be. Yeah. Um, and even if it didn't actually happen in reality as such, we had the, the 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 idea there, the dream that it, it could be possible. You mm. Know? Mm. That's one of the most disappointing things about speculative fiction. Yeah, is that y you read it. This is a parable. This is a warning about the future. And then tomorrow, the future arrives. You think, oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! We yeah, it, things didn't quite work out in the way that perhaps would hoped. No, yeah, no. got got a lot of that going on at the moment. No. Certainly, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, you're uh, a teenager, you're reading this stuff, you're it's starting to become that brain worm that Michael Moorcock becomes, and then, you know, you get into heavy metal, and then all of a sudden you're playing heavy metal bands in the Midlands, which, of course, is absolutely apt, because the Midlands is the birthplace of true heavy metal, as we all oh. know. So how did all that go, and, you know, what, what was your life as a heavy metal musician like? Oh, um, I started off playing uh, guitar, Rhythm guitar, really, because I'm I'm a shit guitarist. If <laughs> you know, I am, I am, I can just about hold a tune as long as it hasn't got more than about four chords in it. Um, yeah. But uh, so I did that, and I was in a band called Snowblind, and we we did a few bits and pieces with that. Um, and then I started doing backing vocals, and I realised actually I ain't got a bad voice, and mm. so I thought, okay, I'll start singing. Uh, and then I got um, poached by a group called Manitoba, which very odd name, but based up you know named after a place in canada yeah and um i was doing vocals for them and we did sort of i think it was about 98 gigs in one year which was just, for a for a tiny pub band was yeah. actually good going then there was personal difficulties obviously as there are in bands the two guitarists were hated each other because mm. guitarists are like that aren't they? you know mm. it's all ego it's all how many riffs can you do and how loud can i turn this up mm. and um so that split, and then part of that reformed into another band, and uh, which I joined, and that was called Spring Auction Torture. Mm. Um, Great name. 
I know. Yeah, it was a pretty good name. And it, you could you could shorten it to the Sat Band, which was cool. You know, so you could be the Sat Band, but Spring Auction Torture if you had yeah. a big T-shirt to put it on. Yeah. And then after that, I just sort of like got out of the whole uh, music scene for a while. And I, I was I'd started really getting heavily into the martial arts more, and I was doing a lot of that. Hmm. Um, then I started bodybuilding based on the martial arts because I wanted to get fitter and stronger. Yeah. And then uh, I, I started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I ended up playing American football because uh, the Birmingham Bulls, who one of the um, semi-pro local teams, were looking for for people. So somebody said, just go along and, and uh, do a tryout. Yeah. I got into the squad, which shot me, and I played a couple of seasons with them. At this point, I was about 20 stone. Oh, yeah. I was like massive. Yeah. Uh, and then due to various problems, I, I, I fucked my knees up. You know, I mean, this uh, is what happens, especially when you're, you're playing at um, a sub-pro level where they don't really care about the athletes. All they mm. care about is you getting up on the pitch and turning up to practices. Mm. So um, my knees got fucked and uh, I ended up um, sort of having to give that up. Uh, and then after uh, um, a couple more years, I met up with some guys who I hadn't seen for a long time and I thought, oh, let's form another band. So then there was a band called, what's that one called? Uh, the Dead Remember after the Dostoevsky novel, I think. Mm. Um, and that was a sort of like um, electronic, uh, industrially type metal band. Yeah. And uh, we gigged and did a few, uh, you know, quite a lot of stuff with that. And then when that split, some me and a couple of the guys who were left over from that band formed a band called the Temple Dogs, not Temple of the Dog, but the yeah. Temple Dogs. And uh, we did that for a couple of years as well. I mean, it was mostly sort of like pubs and a few local festivals and all this sort of stuff. But yeah, it was good fun. You know, mm. um, we did a lot of stuff. And in the end, I just got bored of it, to be honest. Because mm. that was a few years down the line. I was probably about 34, 35 when I actually finished. Yeah. But I decided I wanted to do other stuff. So, you know, just happens, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's it's a real shame thinking back that, you know, I was – knock about with friends and I was I was never in a band but I knocked about with plenty of people who were in bands and if we'd had the technology that we have now back then all of these things would be immortalized as oh. mp3s or wavs rather yeah. than c60s recorded yeah. on a far track in someone's oh. bedroom that yeah, long yeah. since deteriorated and snapped in someone's shitty cassette recorder <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, a, it's a real shame uh, because there's I don't know but is there something about that kind of stuff being ephemeral you know, and, and and only there in your memory, perhaps yeah. perhaps these things do belong in the memory rather than stuck on a website somewhere that nobody can access. Or we've had a few conversations with people who, who, who you know, create art of one form or another, and we we live in this society now where thanks to things like the internet and technology, yeah. you can self publish, you can get stuff out there, but then how do you get it found and noticed? Yeah, in this yeah, sea of stuff. There are there are so many books published every year now that it's it's you know it's proper it's Russian roulette but with a, like a billion chambers and one bullet yeah. actually playing try, trying to get a book published. Yeah. I mean, I was really lucky because um, I'd written the first Me and the Monkey back in. I mean, I started it in 2012, I think it was, or 2013. Yeah, and I, I was um, basically I was. Uh, I work in the live events industry normally. Yeah. Um, and I was out on going to shows and things. And I was uh, writing this stuff in the middle of the night half the time at mm. gigs and, and events and stuff like that. Sat backstage writing this stuff on my phone or my iPad. Um, and I did it in a, a sort of like um, a, a blog version so I could do snippets and then publish it. And I was basically just publishing each snippet on um, Facebook. Yeah. And that's how I started to get a bit of a following doing that. And people going, oh, yeah, this is really good and stuff. Anyway, when I, I finally came to an end of that one, I thought, oh, that was an interesting, you know, experiment. And then I, I basically just left it alone, didn't do anything with it. And then lockdown arrived and um, live events industry just disappeared completely. So mm. I'm thinking, no, what can I do? I'm bored. And I thought, I know, I'll have a look at me and the monkey. So I re-read it again and thought, oh, there's a lot of stuff here. I, I needs changing, really, needs rewriting, needs beefing up a bit but i know i'll try and do this and just for a laugh i'll see if i can get it published so i i rewrote it uh and big chunks of it and and then i thought who shall i send it to not many people were accepting um submissions because of the amount of books that were coming out mm. so i tried door in in the states which i thought why not you know what i mean they, absolutely they, they publish a load of sci-fi and, and fantasy stuff so i sent it off to them 
I had a quite a nice letter back from them saying, oh, yeah, no, it's 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 not for us at the moment. He didn't rip me or anything like that. It was actually quite decent. Um, and I thought, oh, that's fair enough. Yeah. And then the second lot I, I sent off to was a, a company called Bad Ink Press, who are uh, like a cult publishers in the UK. Yeah. And um, I just got a, a letter back saying, this is either the biggest load of crap I've ever read. Or <laughs> and I'm like, please, please say it's genius. And um, they said, we'd like to offer you a contract. So um, I sent the you know complete manuscripts through, worked through a few bits that they wanted changing and stuff, and uh, they bless them, they published it. So uh, you know that's the, that was the start of my writing career. <laughs> probably. That's fantastic because and and it makes sense as well because when I started reading it, it's it, it's in the form essentially of a daily diary, yeah, isn't it? And I started reading, it, I was thinking, what am I reading here? Yeah. And then I think it's a reference to. The monkey making himself his own Justin Bieber mask out of ham. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, aha, <laughs> yeah, I like this is on my wavelength. <laughs> uh, I, and uh, and you know, suddenly it clicked. I got into it, started enjoying it, and of course, a plot starts to emerge. Yeah, through yeah. these uh, through these daily entries. But what was the what was the origin of the idea? Because uh, how, how would you exp- – for a start, it's all right us talking about what the origin idea when we both know what it is. Yeah. How would you explain Me and the Monkey, Chronicles of the Monkey God Volume 1, to the uninitiated? Uh, um, I have pondered this. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> some, somebody from the States wrote a review of the book, and they loved it, but they said, this is some schizophrenic shit. <laughs> And it was like, yeah, yeah, you're probably right, actually. And it was like oh, one sentence review. Yeah, yeah. Oh fucking god, five stars. You know? yeah. um, and I'm like, that's brilliant. That's that's probably my favourite review because yeah. it is like that. I was interviewed by by um, BBC West Midlands, I think, on the radio about the first book when it came out. And the the, the woman who interviewed me asked me the sort of same thing. And I said, well, well, it was it was an experiment to see if I had the discipline to write something every single day. Mm and turn it into something more than just blurb. So like I said, I was out on the road and I was doing this. So I was doing this and I was publishing it. Uh, but after, after probably about a month of doing these daily entries, I thought, I've got, to have a, I've got to have a plot. I can't just keep writing crap. A, because I can't keep thinking of funny things every day. Um, so, <laughs> that puts putting pressure on yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so uh, I thought, well, if I have a plot, and then maybe a couple of subplots, there'll be some funny stuff that I can squeak into to that and make work. So that's where the, the, the sort of the plot aspect and the storylines began to come up. So, okay, so so me and the monkey, like, basically, it's it's the story of a of, of this guy who ha, um, has been in a failed relationship and he goes off on a massive months-long binge to Amsterdam with some of his buddies to basically wipe the memory of this bad relationship out of his head. Um, so he's drinking, drugging, whoring, whatever. And all his buddies go home because he's he's basically gone beyond the pale. Mm-hmm. And um, he ends up in a bar and he sees this dude who's got a monkey sitting on his shoulder. And this bloke's looking at him. This bloke looks pretty evil. So he gets a bit nervous because him and this monkey, who appears to be really paying you know, vast attention to him, are, are really freaking him out. And he's probably, you know, I think in, in the thing, he's, he's either coming down off them or he's, tripping his tits off anyway so he's like not sure what the hell is going on yeah. and he he wanders off and he ends up in this coffee house and uh it's 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 a coffee house on a bridge in amsterdam that looks like a moroccan um uh, uh, it's a copy of a moroccan coffee house but obviously with a big dope counter and stuff like that mm. and um and it's a real place so you know i've, I've been there and, I, and, and when i was thinking this i thought wow that'd be great that mm. could be an evocative vivid place um, anyway, he goes in there to sort of get out the way, and this guy follows him with the monkey, and um, he challenges him to a game of Othello. Uh, and I, I don't know why Othello; it just came to me. This sort of like black and white counters. Yeah, why not? Let's do this. So um, they start playing Othello, uh, and it, he soon realizes that the winner of this is he's going to keep the monkey. If he if he loses, he will get the monkey. If the other guy loses, he will keep the monkey. Mm. So that way around. So they play this game. And anyway, this he loses and this guy just walks away, leaving the monkey sitting there. And it's at this point in time that the monkey talks to him. And um, and it's like, fuck it out. Right? You know what I mean? And uh, it's, it's then this idea that he takes this monkey back to Cornwall with him. 
where he lives, because uh, I live in Cornwall, so easy, in it, you know yeah. what I mean? Yep. Um, and then it's as the story develops from the beginning of the book, it's how the monkey, instead of being just completely id and and just hurling shit at everything and swinging off the curtains and, and smashing stuff up, he begins to get a, a concept of his own self-awareness and he begins to read books and all sorts of mad books, um, you know, like everything from um, uh, philosophy and politics and magic and physics and all sorts of things. And he begins to become self-aware and, and actually pretty intelligent. And he starts doing all this um <laughs> he starts doing uh, um, magic rituals to stop it raining because it won't stop raining. And he wants to go outside and he hates being mm. stuck indoors. And so he does this mad ritual and uh, creates a black hole in the spare room. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and from that point onwards, that's when it really goes mental. And, and yeah, and it, and really, it's about this, this, the journey of this, this monkey who becomes self-aware and realises that he is the reincarnation of a, of a monkey deity who's a, pretty much eternal. But he's the the living embodiment of chaos, not in the, the sort of like the Moorcock sense of a lord of chaos who does whatever he wants to and that sort of thing. This guy is like this guy carries chaos with him everywhere he goes. He's just whatever he does, he's chaotic. But he's just he's completely blasé about the whole thing. Yeah, he, he's got no agenda. He just is. He is what he is. Yeah. And he realizes he's been reincarnated in different forms. And there's various adventures in. Um, Cambodia and the edge of Vietnam where he, he he does all this sort of stuff and then they travel via the black hole to area 51 and to uh Chernobyl and um where else do they go oh Iceland and all this sort of stuff so this this mad thing happens and the, the narrator who's who's basically caught in this web of of nonsense um just goes along for the ride and um a lot of this stuff I you know I've, I've tried to weave the idea of um the fact that they've been mutated by uh the, the drug dmt uh because the uh the, the narrator was was experimenting with it in amsterdam it altered his perception and shifted him into a different reality and uh the monkey was experimented on as a baby monkey in a lab in uh, thailand and they gave him dmt and this has kicked his consciousness into full overdrive mm. and actually made him realize his full potential and who he is so it, it's the story arc is basically him from a ship friendly little git to um to sort of like some sort of creature that could destroy reality if you yeah. want to um, and yeah that was a long way of, of describing that but <laughs> well it's a very apt description and yeah. I, I think a, a couple of the things that i'd call out is that number one the, the the situation with the narrator is super identifiable <laughs> if you if you're used to kind of moving those kind of circles oh, yeah. and get up to those kind of things obviously we didn't have a, a, a chaotic monkey god uh, move in with us back in those days but yeah. the descriptions of getting freaked out by people staring at you in a in a, a, a cafe in amsterdam when you're tripping balls yeah. is very <laughs> identifiable yeah. um i think you know i'm not from cornwall but there are references to things like the witchcraft museum is it bur castle yeah where three i was oh i've been there yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. and so it's, it's it has that um that what one foot in in reality and real life and experience mm. and i don't know to me I, I was thinking what if what if John Dacre didn't have these um, memories and end up going to other worlds. What if a lot of chaos just moved in with him? Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and they go on a journey of discovery together yeah. and, uh, and and kind of figuring lots of things out. And, you know, obviously in, in my shitty bachelor pad where we all used to do buckets, we didn't have a, a black hole in the spare room either. <laughs> um, but that there were times where we probably thought we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not much sure I'll do that to you. Yeah. Do my <laughs> That's right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's 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 great stuff, and it's unlike anything else I've ever read, and that's one of the beauties of it. It, it is kind of unique in the way it's uh, it's not unique in the way it's structured, but the combination of the format and the uh, the characters, the jokes, the nods, the the obvious injections of real life and experience. It's just a a really entertaining fantasy story. It's great, and it's different. From anything else I've read, I'm so really it. <laughs> yeah. So what about what about volume two? I mean, you can't give it. Don't give us any major spoilers, but you know, you've been writing volume two. What's next? How how long could this continue for? Well, I've, there's definitely going to be three volumes. Hmm. I've got the I've got the, the start of, of um, 
volume three at least planned out in note format. So I know where it's going. Uh, sad that, and it, it started from me writing shitey little bits and pieces one at a time and then just making it up. And now I've got a plan. It's like, mm. no way. Mm. Um, but but yeah, so, so volume two pretty much starts off where volume one finishes. And um, so they're still in, in Amsterdam because they end up there, obviously, at the end of volume one. And there's this basically a call to arms once again from these characters who he's met and he has to go on these little sort of like journeys to find stuff. Which I think is is uh, is you know pretty much the quest is the basis of all fantasy novels. If you haven't got a quest, it's yep. difficult to to hang the story onto something, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, you got to so, go into quest mode, oh, as, we, yeah. as we always say, don't you? Absolutely. Mm. So um, so they they go on uh, they go to uh, South America uh, this time and meet some dubious dodgy characters in South America. Um, they have. Um, a whale of a time in Bolivia. They um, they then go back to the UK, and uh, this time they're living in Reading rather than in, in the Cornwall, because the house in Cornwall has been completely destroyed. Yeah. So now they're in Reading, and uh, from there they get involved with um, a, a secret, dodgy secret government organisation, who um, it turns out have links to a previous monkey in the past, and uh, this all sort of like develops and 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 builds up. And then there's loads of stuff with uh, our good old Arno Whitaker, who's the 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 bad guy of the whole thing. He's the Sauron character, if you know. Mm. <laughs> and you find out stuff about him. There's not really any showdowns with him because I want to keep him going. I want to keep him as a sort of like a running character through this until we get into volume three, yeah. when we'll actually have some some proper meat and veg beat ups with him. Yeah. And yeah, and there's, there's some plot twists. Uh, there's there's characters not being exactly who you think they are and there's other characters who are in who were brought into it to pad the story out a bit and, and stuff so yeah it's more of the same but probably with more of more storytelling just mm. than one line of jokes <laughs> <laughs> well i hope you don't use too many of them oh no i've tried to keep as many in as possible yeah, yeah. yeah. i have yeah. i've tried to keep off there's a few, there's loads of cultural references as well to like bad TV and movies and yeah. um, games that we all played as kids, you know, yeah. like the whole thing about Sky Electric in there and yeah. battling tops and all this sort of stuff. Um, well, things, one thing people like us love is, uh, hence doing podcasts like this, yeah. is reflected on things that we dug back in the past. Oh, yeah. and, and, and it's it's it makes it appealing for for us and friends of ours and, and people who enjoy this kind of pastime. Actually, that kind of, you know, reminiscence and, but not just that, not just that reminiscence of thinking, oh, wasn't X really great, but also, you know, thinking back and thinking, yeah, such and such was a bit crap, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Know, you know, every, everybody's evil can evil handle broke off. You oh, know, man, we all have those things in common. Yeah. I mean, being sort of like, because, um, because I'm, I'm sort of 61 this, this year, I was 61. Yeah. So, so I was, um, I was a kid in, the 60s at the end of the 60s um and i remember a lot of the stuff from there just vaguely like i remember the moon landing and all this yeah. sort of stuff. um but i also remember one of my mates had this toy called a johnny seven which was a gun which came to bits do you remember the johnny seven i i only remember the johnny seven because i had cousins who were your age yeah so my dad's oldest brother all of his kids were 10 11 12 13 oh. years older than us so we used to get hand-me-downs from them like in the in the late seventies, early eighties, I was being given nineteen sixty eight champion annuals, yeah. or or tiger, yeah. or um, I mean, hot spare went on for a while longer, but yeah, I think I think it was the tiger annual that had the original Robot Archie comic yes. strips in right. it. So yeah. I was I was kind of exposed to all of those yeah. because of having older cousins, and I remember Johnny Seven, yeah, not not because I I had but through hand me downs, yeah. Well, mm. one of my mates had one, and I was just so jealous. It was just like the best thing ever because it had a grenade launcher and it had yeah. all the shit that used to happen and a gun would come out the bottom of it. And if we ever went and sort of like I went and played in his garden and he'd get the Johnny 7 out and he'd have the big chunky bit like with the grenade launcher and things and he'd give me the little gun that came out the bottom and I was like, oh man, this is just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. I, could, I could never get my parents to buy one because it was like quite expensive. Mm. And, then, and, uh, and you, you think back now, was it really as good as it was? And in my my memory of that as a kid, it was the best thing ever, and you would have murdered people for one. <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I must say, I, I have really fond memories of the boxes of stuff that you used to bring bring around, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
Like, every, everything had a every all the comics had really cool names like Lion and Tiger yeah. and Hotspur yeah. and Champion, you know. And I was due to another uncle, I was uh, very much a, a Commando comics, and it, I think he used to get Warlord annuals. Yeah. Yeah, so so I've cut, I used to get he'd get a Warlord annual every Christmas, read it, and then give it to me, and he'd get Commando comics, read them, and give them to me. So at one point, I had I had my God, you think back now, if you still had all this stuff like sitting on a shelf, yeah. I mean the annu- annuals were made out of pulp paper, so they probably would have all disintegrated by now. But yeah, all those Commando comics and um, Wall, no, it wasn't Warlord, it was Victor. Oh, Victor, yeah, Victor, yeah, Warlord was. The slightly rougher, harder version of Victor, wasn't it? Victor was still very much um, stiff upper lip and RAF pilots giving it to Jerry. Whereas Warlord, you had Pat Mills, I think, at, that, at some point writing stories yeah. for Warlord. So it was it was a little bit tougher. And I think, did, didn't Warlord have things like um, Hellman? There was a, a Carlos Esquera drawn Sven Assel knockoff about yes. German tankers. So That's yeah, cool. Warlord had a, 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 a bit more um, a bit more grit to it. But yeah. Uncle, the uncle always used to give me his Victor annuals. I used to love all that stuff. Oh, I God, yeah. Love Commando. it all. Commando yeah. was, was brilliant. He used to buy Commando regularly and just, mm. just read that. And it was just so good with the, mm. with the little, the, um, the uh, Fairburn Sykes fighting knife drawing on the back of it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That was just awesome. <laughs> and, and, and still going and apparently still selling yeah. something like 20,000 copies per yeah. issue. Yeah. I only saw that on Twitter a couple of weeks ago. I was like, holy shit. I knew, I knew Commando was still going, but still to be selling twenty odd thousand copies of every issue—that's that's some good going. But yeah, I guess it's great because it kept people like Ian Kennedy in work right up until his late eighties. Bless him, yeah. you know, which is um, absolutely fantastic. He was still doing covers for Commando right up until his death. Which, yeah, great uh, album. Such a lovely fella as well. Met him at a, a comic art exhibition. Um, thought there's an annual comic art thing called Thought Bubble. Used to be in Leeds every year. It's now in Harrogate. And went along a couple of times, and and what a bloody lovely fella he was! Such a sweet old bloke. And um, I got uh, he did illustrations on boards, didn't do them on paper, and was selling them. I think for something stupid like twenty quid or thirty quid, I got um, illustrations that he'd done of Rojars and Hammerstein. And um, I think I've got a, a rogue trooper that he did as well. Oh, right. But he would just stand and talk to you. And tell you about his his career in in drawing and comics and such a lovely bloke, yeah, yeah, really nice guy. But you know, we're turning into turning into reminiscence corner. <laughs> um, so when you were into Moorcock, and you, what other and you've mentioned Conan, but what other kind of fantasy and genre fiction do you think has has had an influence on your writing and your writing style, if any? And, and reading a lot of Moorcock stuff, particularly about the sort of like the the, the Lords of Chaos and, and the um, this this whole idea of altered states and, and different realities and things, made me go, actually go and look at books on metaphysics. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, there's me as a late teenage kid sat in Birmingham Library with books on metaphysics, reading this and thinking, <laughs> what the fuck's this all about? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then I got into um, stuff like uh, uh, Alistair Crowley and mm. Austin Osmond Spare. The, golden dawn i was reading all this stuff avidly because i didn't understand a word it said yeah. but I, I i felt that the, maybe there was something there and i just couldn't put my finger on it just the same as with the moorcock stuff i always felt there was something just beyond mm. the corner of my vision that i couldn't every time i turned it disappeared and so I, I i picked up these books and i started looking at them and i gradually accumulated quite a large collection of this stuff and i you know i've got like um uh, works by john d and all this sort of stuff and i i uh, got quite a large occult library. And then for my sins, I discovered Carlos Castaneda. Mm. Um, and then I, I read my way through all of those. Uh, I buggered off to South America and did stuff out there in the jungle. And um, I came back and mixed with a load of people who were into shamanism and neo-shamanism and all this sort of stuff and and went to all these way out things and, and did some stuff. And it expanded my consciousness because I, I sort of realised that that there are things out there that you don't understand, whether mm. they're real or not. But what you do when you, you, you do all this stuff is that you put a marker pin somewhere in the distance mm. and then you find your way to the marker pin. So you gradually make a map of the universe that's bigger than your understanding of it right mm. now. And, it's, and the, the best thing in life is, I think, is to go and find those pins. 
Mm. So you put one out there and then you go searching for it and you discover it. You think, wow, and then there's new horizons beyond that. And I guess a lot of the reading I was doing at the time that was uh, the genre fiction type stuff. I mean, I, I read um, Gates of Iverell. Have you read the CJ no. Cherry? Cheryl? I'm aware of the author, but I've not read any. Oh, uh, Gates of Iverell. I loved, absolutely loved it. Uh, the She's got a, the, the, the main character uh, is this female who comes from the future and she's gone right back into this sort of medieval society on this, this world. And she's got a sword, which is actually pretty much Stormbringer. Right. It's, it doesn't steal souls. The tip of the sword will throw whoever it touches into outer space and they just die in this void. <laughs> so I thought, wow, this is a really cool twist on the whole thing. Yeah. You know? But really well written and... Um, quite sort of like empathic with the sidekick that she gets, who's basically a bondsman who from this this medieval world mm-hmm. who who she takes on and they they go and they have these adventures together and, and all this sort of stuff. But it's quite brutal because she's really hardcore and she's really sort of like not she's not at all impressed. There's no romance in the whole thing. It's all, you know, it's it's quite strong storytelling from a mm. female character point of view. Yeah. What's that book called? I'm gonna write that down. Uh, Gates of Iverell. Gates of Iverell. Right, yeah, cool. And there's a couple of others who I can't remember what those are, but that one was the one that really hooked me into that. Mm. And then I, I sort of got out of genre fiction a bit um, after a while. But I, I'm I'm a I'm a big nerd about the the about Troy and the whole mm. Iliad and Odyssey thing, and I will read just about anything that is about Troy. Mm. And I discovered um, a couple of writers who uh, female writers actually, and. This is really bad, but I can't remember their names. One wrote a book called A Thousand Ships, mm. and it's about uh, the, the launching of a thousand ships in Helen of Troy. Uh, but it's done from a female perspective, and right. the is absolutely stunning. Mm. And um, and then there's another one based on Greek mythology called Circe, which is, I think that's Madeleine Miller. And that, I think, might be my favourite all-time book. It, it's written in a way that just... It, there's something about it that just grabbed me and just sucked me into it. And yeah. I was I was there in ancient Greece with this basically a deity who chooses to be well, he's exiled, and then all of the things that go on around it, and all of the mortals who are chess beating goons basically, yeah. who who think they are better than everyone and everything. And she just watches them basically fade away and die because she's immortal and and mm. she's left alone in this this lonesome world of her own mm. where she's exiled by the gods. And any any mortal that she loves is is doomed to die. And it's and it, I read it and I thought, fuck me, this this is a, an amazing piece of writing. It's mm. just absolutely superb. And then other books that have really hit me, uh, 1984, George Orwell, that is probably my second favourite all time book. Yeah, uh, and I've read that I don't know how many times. I read it at school to start with, and then uh, I must have been the only kid in class who read it about three other times in the year. And yeah. um, I think once again, it gets this bleak reality and, and actually a, a real understanding of, of how fucked up humans can be mm. when they want to be, uh, all because of an idea, all because mm. of a concept. And, you know, you look back at uh, the, the 20th century and, uh, and fascism mm. and, uh, and Stalin and all of that, really. And, and the, all they are are ideas. Mm. It, it, it's just an idea. But mm. it's hooked so many people and made them do such bad things that, you know, you could see how 1984, especially from Orwell's perspective when he wrote it, was quite a, a strong possibility for our future. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and maybe it still is. I hope not. But, um, you know, a lot of the dystopian writing tends to be a little bit, I, I find a little bit samey. Mm. People can't come up with a good idea. I thought mm. Logan's run was good because, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you reach over population states, what are you going to do? Fucking love Logan's run. Yeah, I, I, I'm talking about the movie though. I've, I have got, I did pick the book up. I've got that kicking around somewhere, but I've never read the William F. Nolan novel. It's been on my to read pile for like five years. But I'm a, a, a huge lover of the movie. That's oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, wacky, strange music and all. I think it's wonderful. I can't get enough of it. It's funny you mentioned, and again, you're gonna have to send me a list of some of these book names because oh. Phil's been asking. She's she's been asking me. My family are asking for Christmas ideas. Oh, right. okay. <laughs> so some of these things sound interesting. But the the one about the Greek immortal actually reminds me a little bit of a book that Pops gave me a copy of, which actually the the paper is so pulp and so um, fragile. I've got it in, I've still got the original copy in a plastic bag, but it's just disintegrating. Where is it? It's around somewhere. Oh, there it is. 
one second. I, okay. I am aware that for podcasting, this is terrible content because I... I'm, I'm going to show you something. <laughs> <laughs> for some reason, I've taken it out of the plastic bag and not put it back in, but it's fallen to bits. Um, my first oh, 2,000 yeah. years Okay. by Virek and Eldridge, which is it's, it's just disintegrating in my hands as, as I'm holding it. But Pats gave this to me when I was about 14, and he loved it. And essentially, it's uh, about the the legionary who puts his spear in Christ's side, is cursed, yeah, yeah. and lives for essentially for two thousand yeah. years. And he has this on on and off relationship with Salome, who was also cursed to eternal life. And it's uh, a wild mixture of history, occultism, themes of reincarnation sex eroticism it's it's really fantastic but i do in some ways dread reading it again mm. just in case <laughs> it ends up being a bit dodgy in places <laughs> because you know you, you read these things at the time and a lot of this stuff is wasted on you but pops had a a, a really quite um unusual and unique taste in books he liked all the the, the fancy and genre stuff Thought H.P. Lovecraft was crap. You know, much preferred William Herp Hodgson. So I was introduced to William Herp Hodgson before I was introduced to Lovecraft. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, the only reason I ever knew the name Lovecraft is because the cover of the house on the Sphere edition of the House on the Borderlands he gave me has a pull quote from Lovecraft describing it as a classic of the first water, whatever yes. the fuck that means, because yeah. Lovecraft can't even review a book without coming up with some weird language. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this uh, Virick and Eldridge, and apparently one of them may have been a problematic character, as we say, in modern parlance. So uh -huh. really, really fantastic book. But again, you mentioned, just commenting on some things you mentioned, when you go down that, that rabbit hole of suddenly getting a uh, a hint of things like esotericism and theosophism and, and all these things and I mean god if I went to South America and got offered things where you would expand your mind that would be an absolute fucking disaster for me because I would spend the next 40 years of my life in one long panic attack because I can't I just can't cope with this stuff anymore I think I did too much of it in my teens and 20s but that there's there's something about that stuff which makes I think when when you reach for it and you look into it, you know, and it's like I can remember pre-internet being becoming fascinated with Madame Blavatsky and, and and all that stuff, and you kind of reach for it, you try and find some information, but it's always just out of grasp. It's just always out of reach, yeah. and you never get a satisfying grip on what is behind it. It's just always out of reach. Mm. I think I've just come to the conclusion now that actually that's what makes it so interesting and fascinating and such good fodder for the imagination and to actually fuel things whether it be writing or gaming or you know any of these things it's uh it's, it's fascinating stuff absolutely I, you know, I couldn't agree more than that i mean once again it's experiences in life and, and if it doesn't kill you i'm not saying if it doesn't kill you it's going to make you stronger because sometimes yeah. it doesn't happen either yeah. sometimes we put you in a wheelchair yeah. um, but, but um if it doesn't kill you it's often interesting enough that you'll have a good story out of it yeah i, I found that with all the esoteric stuff that it um you know it broadened my horizons enough that it stopped me being it's not me being judgmental about things. Hmm. You know, I, I, I could look at something that was completely off the wall and think, yeah, and it's fine. You know, hmm. as long as nobody's hurting themselves, it's fine. Yeah. And so I, I think that helped a lot with that. And um, I mean, all the Castanedian stuff and all the, the, the shamanism stuff, you know, when you've sat in enough drum circles banging a drum uh, for, for long enough, you, you think, oh, okay. And, you know, I've, I've, I've wandered off on these retreats and been up in the mountains where you have to blindfolded jump off ledges and all sorts of mm. odd shit there's a lot to be honest there's a lot in the books i write which is personal experience and some of it when i think about it is actually quite fucking hell did i really do that and it's mm. yes i did really do that and I'm, I'm you know i'm glad i did it but you think whoa would i advise anyone else to do it? maybe not but yeah you know uh, uh it is good stuff and it's the, the whole Blavatsky thing, I mean, what a woman. When mm. you find out about how you really need to read her right life history, she mm. was off with like um, Cossack commanders and all this sort of stuff <laughs> yeah. and riding across the steps. Yeah. On wild horses. And she was a proper, she was a, I bet if they made a film about her, yeah. they could just ignore the whole, um, the, the theosophy side of it and just have her as a, a, a female heroine character. She'd be brilliant. Yeah. She'd 
in us of most of the ones they they put in these films, it was so anodyne that there's always some sort of like, oh, yeah, I must be saved by someone. Yeah. But that Blavatsky was a fucking nut job. She was, yeah. was full on. She was. Yeah, a, a few years ago, I was, you, you know, sometimes you just start and don't finish things, don't you? Well, yeah. I, I certainly do. I start things and I very rarely finish them. On, in, in my hard drive, I've got little bits of short stories that I started and never finished and... Mm. I've got uh, game ideas that I started and never finished and setting ideas that I started and never finished. And one of them was about, um, you know, al- alternate versions of Earth. And one of them was the key protagonists in it were Madame Blavatsky and the League of Theosophists. <laughs> you know, because at the time I was like, oh, yeah, Blavatsky. Awesome. So yeah. much, so much brilliant inspiration for interested story ideas and excitement and all this business. And yeah. And at the end of the day, who doesn't love a good Cossack charge in their fiction? Indeed, you know? indeed. My experience is in the Third World War. Though. Yeah, but bring it on. It's, it's it's absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I love all that stuff. Really should try and get back to it. But you know, you, sometimes you go back to things and you and you read it and you you read a th- three pages of a short story and you think, oh, did I write this? It's quite yeah. cool. But more yeah. often I read it and I think, what the fuck was I on about? <laughs> you know what? Put it in the recycle bin. On the whole writing side of it. it I, I really found that writing in small episodic pieces mm. really helped me because it allowed me to sort of like not concentrate too much on the storyline and actually just get stuff out there. Mm. And then once the plot developed, then then you by that time you've actually got some experience of writing and mm. you actually feel more confident in your own voice. Um, oh, look at me, bloody hell! Um, and uh, it's um, that helped me a lot. And and writing number two. It's still episodic, but the episodes are much longer and they're much more narrative. Mm. So I've actually developed my writing style. Mm. And, that, and instead of buckling down and writing volume three, I'm, I'm writing at the moment um, uh, an Elizabethan sword and sorcery epic. Oh, nice. Um, I was going to ask what else have you got in your brain that you yeah. need to get out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm 12 chapters deep in that at the moment. So, yeah. um, But this, this whole thing, it suddenly occurred to me that Like Moorcock, I I love the idea with Moorcock that he keeps all of his characters in the same universe, even if they're interconnected universes, but they are all, they all know each other, they all bounce off each other. There's Mm. always hints to that. And so what I wanted to do was to write a sword and sorcery novel. And I love the Elizabethan period because I think uh, there was so much potential. Mm. Um, I mean, they call it the golden age. I think it wasn't. I think basically it it was the start of fucking the world over. Yeah. But, um, But there was potential for change there. It's one of those crucial moments in history where it was a spark where things happened. And uh, doing a lot of background reading on it, and uh, or, or you know, like the Reformation and all this sort of stuff, and and um, the the wars that happened in um, in Europe, in in the Netherlands, the Dutch Netherlands, and uh, sorry, the Spanish Netherlands, and mm. and uh, uh, with the Habsburg Empire and all this sort of stuff, I, I sort of got hooked into the idea that what if you had a character, and and this character was a swordsman, obviously. He's got a big sword. Mm. And he's got he's obviously gonna have an oppo. So you've got your other character with him who's another fighter, but they wanna they've had enough, they've had enough of conflict and that and, and enough of battle. Mm. They want to leave it all behind, but they get dragged back into it through the, the nefarious machinations of um and in this case, Dr. John D, because mm. why not? I mean, the guy, I don't know if you've read anything about D, but man, that he, he was a character in his own right. Yeah, yeah. And so they get pulled back into it through one reason or another, and he sends them on the quest. Um, but during the quest, things happen that, that change everything once again, and also the fact that it's not just him battling Spaniards or whatever. Mm. It's uh, There's an idea that there's magic involved in it, there's time travel involved in it, there is alternate history, alternate r- realities, all this sort of stuff. And the monkey appears in it, but not as the monkey. It's like mm. a much earlier version of the monkey who appears, but more in human form uh, with the Spanish, uh, having come over with the, the gold galleons from um, South America. Yeah. And so, the, the, but he's not a big part in it. He he pops up occasionally, but he's not a major part in it. So this this character is more, has more, sorry, has more of his own um, story arc. Instead of being a secondary character, he's a primary character, but he's still involved in this whole monkey universe. Yeah. And... The, the twists and turns that go on within that and bringing that into the future and, and mm. stuff. Because I love that idea of Morcock does it so well with, with chopping and changing his characters from one point in history to another mm. and then developing small scenarios where they 
uh, they interact with other characters and they observe and they observe what's going on mm. and, what, uh, and they comment on it as well. They, they, you know, just how shit human beings can be mm. or the potential for humans and stuff like that. One of the things I read about Moorcock in one of the books about his writing uh, was that everything he basically writes has a basis of love behind it. So mm. love is the overriding thing that can change everything. It's why Elric destroys the, the, the Dreaming City, mm. because he wants to get Cimarill back. He, it's why um, Jerry Cornelius fucks up his father's mansion and mm. ends up losing his sister. Mm. Regardless of whether it's incestuous or not, it's still love, and, and love is seems to be the big driving force in Moorcock's books in one way, shape, or form. Mm. It's always the, the, the thing that makes his heroes fall over, but also makes them better than they actually could be. I think there's an interesting counterpoint to that as well, in, certainly in things like my experience in the Third World War, where yeah. he does experiment with characters who have almost a sociopathic absence of love. Yes. And, and the consequences that come of that. And yeah, I think I think that I think you're right. I think that is a, a, a key part of the appeal and, and what's at the core of his stories. Yeah, mm. even sometimes when it's inverted. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, that that jealous rage thing because mm. you can see that like, with Yarakum and and um, and Frank. other characters yeah. who are jealous of what the potential that somebody could that's that's uh, of what someone could have with someone else. Yeah, and because they can't have it, they just destroy it and smash it. That's what Gain of the Damned's like as well, yes. isn't it? It's like yeah, yeah. it's like a bitter inverted version of of the Eternal Champion, and it's and it is jealous, bitter rage that drives him to do all the terrible things that he does. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. But always a great motivation for a villain, isn't it? Something oh, real, yeah. something tangible that's identifiable that you know the, the, that we all have a seed of. Oh yeah, you know? that's what you need in a um, a good villain has something that you can relate to. Mm. Because it's that part of you that lives in a dark cupboard that you don't want to go to. Maybe it's the bit that jumps out when you've had too much to drink in a pub and somebody looks yeah. at you or something like that. You know, it's that part that in the morning you deeply regret and you wish would go away. But yeah. um, but if you can put that into a villain in, in a story, then I think it makes it makes that villain reachable and 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 far more frightening. You know, it's good. It's good. Mm. It's good that that sort of thing is is available to to actually be drawn on. Yeah. And at the same time, it, it makes you wonder about yourself sometimes. <laughs> yeah. So your Elizabeth, Elizabethan sword and sorcery novel, yeah. um, is this a long-term project? Is it something that might see the light of day well, imminently? I'm hoping I'm, I'm going to finish it by early next year. I, my writing process nowadays, because I don't, I no longer go on the road since the lockdown and stuff like that, I've decided now I'm going to work from home. Yeah. Uh, my, and because of the nature of my work, I can actually work from home. So I... I spend all day normally sat in front of a computer doing graphics and things for people and video work and this sort of stuff. Uh, and so I write, he's sitting in bed at night and, and I've got a notebook and I do it old school with a pen and, uh, and I just basically fill up notebooks and I'll write until I, I come to a point where I think, well, I need to think about that and I'll stop. And it might only be like uh, a couple of pages yeah. or it be a chapter and then I'll, I'll put it away and uh, then I'll, I'll either come back to it the next night or a couple of nights later and I'll have an idea in my head and then I'll build it out like that. And I've been writing this since probably probably June. So I'm 12 chapters in, so I'm not doing too bad. So I reckon that by the early part of next year, I could have finished it hmm. and then do a couple of edits on it and then get it off to my publisher and see if they, they're interested, which I think they might be. So. Cool. Something potentially to very much look forward to then. Yeah, I so hope in terms of volume one of Me and the Monkey, Chronicles of the Monkey God, so it's Bad Ink Press, sorry, Bad Press Ink. Yes. Got there in the end. So that's available via their website? Uh, it's available on Amazon, and you can go through Goodreads as well. There's a link on there. Bad Press Ink, uh, you know what, this is awful, but I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I, I haven't looked at their website, so I don't know if there's a link on there. There could well be, but it yeah, will probably yeah. take you to Amazon. And the new book, which comes out on the 5th of November, is... Uh, is on Amazon as well. And there's also a short story I wrote called The Paddington Incident, which is about the monkey as well, and fills in some of the gaps to... It, it's almost like if you read Volume 1, then read The Paddington Incident, and then read Volume 2, it all you'll suddenly understand what, why a load of the characters behave the way they do and who they are. Um, so it's sort of like a, a little sort of throwaway steampunk thing I wrote uh, about uh, Victoriana. And if people want to find out more about you and about your work, you've got meandthemonkey.co.uk? Yes, 
And uh, they can also email me, me, blah, email me on that as well. And Goodreads, they can send me messages and stuff. I'm quite happy to talk crap with anyone. So yeah. <laughs> And that, and that was to my benefit today as well, because <laughs> this podcast is all about that. Um, and of course, you're on Twitter as well as, is it me and the monkey zero? Yeah, me and the monkey zero. Me and the monkey zero on Twitter as well. Well, you know, Andy, it's been an absolute pleasure to finally meet you because we've had lots of backs and forths and we've had a few false starts on actually getting this getting this done. But mm-hmm. that just tends to be modern life and actually trying to align diaries. And um, then, of course, I had the spike vax vaccine, which fucked us up last time. But really, really great to, uh, to, to get to talk to you finally and mm-hmm. would love to have you on again. Well, I would love to come on again. Um, yes, let's, let's do it and let's talk about Moorcock more than me. And then um, that would be great. Cool. Well, of course, we are a Mocock adjacent podcast at times as well. Yes. You know, a Mocock flavoured doesn't necessarily mean we always have to do Mocock, and that's why it's always really, really wonderful to talk to someone like you about what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can find some crazy ass pulp stuff, I'd quite happily do that. I mean, uh, I, I saw you uh, looking at the biker stuff, and uh, I've got I've got quite a few of those in there. <laughs> yeah. In January, I'll be hooking up again with Andrew Nett. I can't believe it's almost a year since I talked to Andrew about his book, Dangerous Visions and New Worlds, but time is just fucking flooding by so quickly. So, yeah, I've gone down a real rabbit hole with New England Library biker novels. And because and because I'm an idiot and I've got no impulse control, <laughs> I, I have good... I'll, let me just fan them out. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> all those beautiful photo covers as well. So just for the just for the listeners, I'm showing Andy um, my five Alex A. Stewart New English Library biker novels. We've got the Last Trip, the Outlaws, the Bikers, the Devil's Rider, and the Bike from Hell, and also uh, Mick Norman Guardian Angels and Peter Cave Speed Freaks. Oh, so yeah. we're picking out a couple of them to look at in a little bit more detail, but we will be talking more broadly about New English Library and the art of the exploitation novel. Yeah, <laughs> so, long, long may it live. <laughs> yeah, very much looking forward to that. And, I'm, and I must say, I, I read when I talked to Andrew last time, because he also did a book called Girl Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, which has essays in there about this stuff as well. And at the time I'd picked up the... I couldn't get the New England Library, all three Angels from Hell novels because they're like rocking horse shit. I've got one of them, fortunately, just recently as part of a, a, a bundle. So I got the an omnibus edition and I read the first few chapters and it's strong stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it's stronger and spicier than I expected. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, looking forward to getting into those. But yeah, you know what? Let's let's find something because essentially anything that's pulpy and genre related and has some kind of relationship to the kind of stuff Pops was giving me back in my teens, we'll find something that we both have a similar interest in and we'll get you back on and we'll talk about it. Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, mate. Massive thanks to Andy for stopping by Darian Toms, and apologies too for the sound issues that made him sound like he was in a biscuit tin. We'll do better next time. You can grab me in the monkey from the usual big hitter, but also a range of other suppliers like Blackwell Books, WH Smiths even, and Hive.co.uk. Volume 2 is out on the 5th of November too. You can link to Andy on Goodreads, and his website is meandthemonkey.co.uk. All those books that he mentioned, I'll list those in the show notes. As it happens, as I was editing this, and this is often the case, when I was talking about the Warlord comic, my brain was mashing it up with battle. That's edge for you. For our pads outside the UK, we had a big tradition here of World War II themed comics that tended to be fairly grounded compared to other comics. Victor, Warlord, and the later and grittier Battle, along with the folio-sized Commando comics, were everywhere in my youth. Not just among friends, but dads, uncles, even granddads. In the same way, I suppose, that our tellies were pretty much packed with black and white war movies of the 40s and 50s. It was pretty much impossible to avoid reflections on the war in one form or another. And that could go part way to explaining why this country has such an overwhelming obsession with it to this very day, when even only a tiny handful of veterans remain with us many having spent most of their lives in the intervening period trying to get over it. My own granddads had very different angles on it. Pops hated British war films. It irritated him that they, for the most part, tended to celebrate the officer class whilst representing the rank and file as chirpy geezers and thinly drawn cutouts. My mum's dad, on the other hand, never stopped talking about it and told the same stories 
over and over, right up until his death in his 90s. I heard his stories of burying Australian dead in Tobruk by night, only to have Stukas blown them back out of the ground by day, a bazillion times, or when he had to shovel lime into knocked out tanks in the desert to break down the Gru before they were recovered, because there was insufficient water to hose them out. Bless him, what a thing to carry. Also, on the misremembering and mashing things up front, I conflated the origins of the protagonist of my first 2,000 years with that of Barry Sadler's Casca, the Eternal Mercenary. Mmm, Casca. Another one for the itinerary. Anyway, after a slow start to this year, we've been on a bit of a roll this past couple of months and we've got more shows in the pipeline for the next few weeks. Coming up, we've got the Halloween special with Graham and Phil. We had a patron poll, the candidates being a selection of late 70s stroke early 80s British pulp horrors, and they were Origin of the Crabs by Guy and Smith, The Devils of D-Day by Graham Masterton, Slugs by Sean Hudson, but the winner, by some comfortable distance with over half the votes, The Fog by James Herbert. Simon Perrins, creator of all the visuals for this podcast, an artist, collaborator and inspiration on the journals, stopped by to talk about Mocock-inspired art, comics and all sorts of other stuff. And not before time. We've been on about doing it for yonks. And we've got other irons in the fire too. Speaking of the journals, Nan Soundtracks has released the second teaser track from Journal Volume 2, his second album, inspired by the escapades of the traveller, Gerard Arthur Connolly. As you'll know if you've been a long-term listener, not only has Nand been scoring the audio chapters, but he's already released one album companion, and soon the second will drop. So check out Brainer's Creed on Bandcamp. I'll link to that in the show notes too. Before we go, thanks as ever to our patrons. Those without tear are Anthony Piconti, Sebastian Weetabix, Tim Cardos, and Dave Dempster. Our chaos engineers are Andrew Cicluna, Andrew Van Ness, Anthony Porter, Benjamin Fletcher, Dave Griffiths, Dave Voxman, Jim Kirkland, John W. Lays, Jules Lawrence, Mal Pertwee, Matt Saltz, Menion, Nelbert, Paul McRandall, Simon Perrins, and Tony Malazzo. Our crafty Jugaderos are Alexander Harris, Ian Stead, Loz, Taylor, Matthew Broom, Toby White, Tom Murphy, Mac Hebden, Graham Holden, and Jason Connolly. And of course, our patron demons are Andy Darby, Clarky the Cruel, Fred Keish, Gareth Wilson, Imria, Janie Stim, Jay Risa, Joe Monty, Liam Jay, Miles Reed Lobato, Mortmain, Neil Burton, Paul Hillary, Randall Gatlin, Steve Round, the OG patron, Norman Beresford, and last, but never least, Robert McMillan. And Fred, happy anniversary. Now don't forget you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at Breakfast Ruins. You can email us at breakfastruinsoutlook.com. The webpage is breakfastintheruins.com. You can listen to Breakfast in the Ruins radio via the internet, most easily via Radio Garden. Just search BITR Breakfast in the Ruins or look at the Bradford UK blob. We have our Patreon page too, and there are a few extra odds and sods on there. But in the meantime, take care, stay safe, and we will meet again soon on the Moonbeam Roads.